Greetings, Melvin. How you doing? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, I- I'm doing pretty good. Fantastic. Tell the people how they can support the show. Well, if you want to support the show, you can write us a review, and the best place to leave that would be at Apple iTunes, and you can also give us a five-star rating. That's right. Additionally, you can check out our support page at livexpodcast.com. Hello and welcome to the podcast. My name is Arab Jadala. And I'm Melvin Barnes. And that makes this The Life of X. We are here for part four of Andrew Carnegie. Melvin, how are you doing? Doing pretty good. Research is going good at the university. That's fantastic. Today, we're going to continue our discussion of the life of Andrew Carnegie. Before we dive back in, we are going to read some reviews from those of you who have been so kind as to leave them for us in iTunes. The first one that we have is from Jay Tsunami and says, informative and entertaining, five stars. The Life of X is awesome. This podcast gives a thorough rundown of the lives of some of the most interesting people in modern history in a thorough and concise manner. The hosts are incredibly well-informed and witty, and the chemistry between Melvin and Arif definitely makes learning about historical figures easy and enjoyable. The show also has a good pace and great production. I would definitely recommend to anyone looking for a new podcast experience. And mine is from Boston Flo. Great name. Boston Flo says... The life of Dwight Eisenhower, part one, was interesting. Had no idea his grandfather made the money in the family. Arif and Melvin are natural-born speakers. It's as if they are having a conversation with each other, yet I'm learning from it. They really drew me in. They speak with good energy. I cannot wait to listen to part two. Fantastic. If you would be so kind, dear listener, to leave us a review, we will happily read it aloud on this podcast. Thank you to... Jay Tsunami, and Boston Flow. Now, on to our next order of business. We have a few announcements. I know some of you are just here for that content. You're here to learn about Andrew Carnegie, not to listen to Arif and Melvin talk about administrative things. So, if that's the case, feel free to fast forward to the 8 minute and 21 second mark, and we'll be diving right into the episode. So, the first thing we want to talk about is that For those of you who've been listening to us through however many episodes are out when you hear this, many, we have been doing this on a weekly basis for X amount of weeks, and that has been a ton of work, (laughs) and we knew it was going to be a ton of work when we started, which is why it took us like a year to actually get this thing rolling from when we decided to do it. So we built up a large backlog, and we have burnt through that backlog. (laughs) Yeah, most of it. Yeah. So basically, we're going to keep working at the pace that you know we've been working at. Nothing's going to stop, but it's become pretty apparent that releasing on a weekly basis is probably not going to be sustainable. So we're going to go down to more of a, I want to call it episodic, even though we release in episodes anyway, but kind of like the standard model for a lot of history podcasts, like your Hardcore Histories and your Histories on Fire, which I don't envision us taking as long of gaps as they do because they have larger episodes and stuff. But we're basically going to get these episodes done as soon as possible. And then we will continue to release one hour segments on them every week once they're finished. Yeah. So definitely keep an eye on your feed. And obviously, if you're subscribed, you know, you'll get the heads up when these things drop. Yeah. Not going to be a problem for you. The next thing I want to talk about or we want to talk about is we've actually had some people ask us about our Patreon page. And so I know we've, you know, we talk about it briefly, generally, whenever we talk about like support and that sort of thing. But I just want to take a second to kind of go through our Patreon page. So for those of you who aren't sure or have not familiar with what Patreon is, it's a service that lets you subscribe within their website. And they actually actually let you listen to this audio and all that via a mobile app that they have, or you can listen right on the website. So we upload all of our episodes to Patreon, but whenever we release on Patreon, which is the same time that we release on iTunes, Spotify, wherever else you listen, whoever has decided to pledge or to become patrons gets billed at whatever level they come in at. And so our, you know, we have set up goals. We have different levels that you can join our tiers. So for instance, we have our $1 tier, and, you know, we will shout you out on the show and we will send you a thank you note. If you join at our $2 tier per episode, we will send you 
that thank you note, you'll basically get the same benefits that the tier under gets, and you also will get a nifty Life of X sticker sent to you. We have a $5 tier where you get all of those things and also custom Life of X coffee mug. You can drink the most delicious coffee in the world out of. They're so nice. Yeah. And then we have a $10 tier that if you donate $10 an episode, you will get all those things. And we will also send you a custom made t-shirt. Woo. We have a few goals set up on the website too. So Melvin, do you want to talk about those? Yeah, no problem. So right now we have three main goals. Um, Our first goal is to, you know, get to $50 per episode. And at that point, the podcast itself will be totally self-sufficient, self-sustaining. And me and Arif won't be pouring nearly as much of our money into the podcast. And we can even eat every day. Yeah, we can eat. We can, you know, pet our kittens and dogs and, you know, live a, live a good life. And then our second goal is to get to $200 per episode. Um, and at that point, we can hire someone to do our audio and we won't have to worry about Arif messing it up anymore. True. And we'd be able to get more episodes out because as it stands for about every hour of audio that you get, it takes me roughly three hours to edit down because I'm not good at it. Woo. Well, I'm glad you're doing it and not me. Yeah. So we get a professional out. We might be able to kick some more episodes out more quickly. And they could probably do it in an hour and a half. Mm-hmm. Our last goal is to earn $250 per episode. And at that point, we can do something really special. And that's have artwork for each episode that we have. Because right now, when we release an episode on an individual, we only have that one piece of art uh, that we commissioned from uh, Paris, mm-hmm. uh, who's at Caricatures by Paris. Um, and if we have that, if we meet that goal, then we can uh, get, a, get a piece of art for each episode, which I think, you know, if you enjoy the artwork, it'd be really nice. Yeah. And I personally really like our artwork. Mm-hmm. I think it's really fun to have those. I think it'd be really fun to have episode specific. It'd be really nice if like, w- you know, someday we had a book yeah. and you can have like the artwork for each episode. The description. Yeah. We could send those out to patrons. Uh-oh. 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 All right, well, let's not get ahead of ourselves. We've got to hit that 250 <laughs> per episode first. And the last thing before we actually get into the episode is that one thing that we have kind of discovered that we think you might enjoy is kind of bringing on other people who we know who have expertise in certain fields. And that kind of comes from our series on Shanghai Shek, which I personally really enjoyed doing because it gave me a chance to tap Melvin's expertise. So we have a bevy of human resources at The Ohio State University that Arif and I can tap into to bring you guys even better content. Basically, we want to bring in some of our friends who have expertise in the Soviet Union or South America or, you know, a a specific individual. Yeah. So in some of the coming episodes, we're going to have special guests. There may be an episode or two where I step away and fade into the distance. And someone abyss. else comes in. And maybe we leave Melvin in the abyss. No, <laughs> we, can't, we can't do that. Yeah, so don't panic if in a future series or four, only I'm there with a new co-host or only Melvin is there with a new co-host. We will still be doing our regular episodes. But like Melvin said, we just have friends who you know we get along well with and who we feel like we have good rapport with that have all this background information that we don't have. And obviously when you, when you dedicate a large chunk of your life to studying an area. You learn about interesting people. And I just think that's a great opportunity to bring you all these stories of people's lives in greater context. Yeah. All right. On to the episode. Um, Okay. So if you've been listening all the way through this, all of our administrative details, we appreciate you, but we are now going to dive right in to the life of Andrew Carnegie part four. Melvin, would you like to tell the people where we last left off with Mr. Carnegie? Okay, dear listener. Last time when we left off, Andrew had just published his Gospel of, what was it, Gospel of Wealth? The Gospel of Wealth. Where now he's completely driven to generate as much wealth and money as possible, even at the expense of the people that work for him, so that he, upon his death, can redistribute it to the deserving people in the most ethical ways. And things had also kind of started to get a little testy at Homestead, but the guy who was in charge, Mr. Abbott, at the time gave in to the workers' demands, which naturally made Carnegie very angry. So they had just gotten rid of Abbott and now elevated Frick to basically Andrew's number two. And they're prepping for the coming assault that will take place in 1892 because they signed a three-year contract in 
1889, basically guaranteeing that the gains that the workers had made would last for three years. But Carnegie's already positioning for the, the next showdown. And outside of the business world, Frick was involved in making some decisions that ultimately led to uh, the Johnstown flood, which killed you know, a lot of people. A lot of people. Basically washed a city away. Yeah. Enjoy that golf course, though. And then lastly, you know, 1889, the Harrison administration is really interested in retooling the U.S. ships and basically getting them more armor. So, <laughs> Or any armor at all. <laughs> instead of being wooden ships. Yeah. Andrew, kind of in an about face, has uh, started to, you know, st- had started working with these armor contracts and is now supplying the U.S. Navy, even though before he was a devout pacifist and refused to do anything like that. Yeah. So that's where we're going to pick up now. And we are at December 30th, 1890. On that day, workers at the Edgar Thompson Steelworks told management that they would stop working if hours weren't reduced to the eight-hour shift. Because remember, some of these guys were still on that 12-hour shift. I can't imagine working in like a, a steel mill 12 hours. And then weren't they working six days a week? Yeah. I don't know if they all were, but I know that a lot of these people were working 12 hours, six days a week. Man. Wild. You can't have had any sort of life outside of that you probably sleep the whole seventh day right i mean and and it's funny because remember andrew was saying like take some time to (laughs) to pick up a craft yeah i just can't imagine being in that heat that environment for 12 hours and then doing anything besides sleep yeah that was on uh december 30th 1890 then january 1 1891 the workers are like oh hell no and they leave and they drive other workers out as they leave. And they also start destroying some property there. And so the sheriff was called in to Edgar Thompson to start protecting basically this property, which is, is kind of an interesting dynamic because here you have the sheriff who is an agent of the law or whatever, who should be protecting all parties at this point is kind of being used by big business to chase off these other people. And I mean, don't get me wrong. These other people were acting in a criminal manner, but right. still- but it's like the, the state supplied Pinkertons. Right. And you will see that they kind of start acting in that role later on. And so it was interesting, too, because the author really points out this kind of like racial aspect to this whole situation. The sheriff comes in and deputizes a bunch of workers and he also arms them. And what I mean by the racial aspect is that a lot of the people who were doing this, like carrying out this, driving people off and damaging property were unskilled workers. So at the steelworks, you had your skilled workers, you had your unskilled workers, and your unskilled workers are basically just doing grunt work, I guess, for lack of a better term, whereas your skilled workers are like the machinists and that sort of thing. Now, kind of just following like U.S. immigration patterns, a lot of these skilled workers had come from Western Europe. A lot of these unskilled workers were from Eastern Europe. And at the time, they were considered like a lesser tier of European. So what you see is that this sheriff comes in and deputizes all these Western European skilled workers, and they just manhandle these Eastern European strikers who are, A, already just barely getting by and are about to see their situation get a lot worse. On March 20th, 1891, and this is at H.C. Frick Coke Company, so Frick's Coke Company, seven strikers were shot by, uh, who were they shot by, local police or? I believe it was the Pinkertons, because this was Frick breaking a strike at his own Coke Works. So he breaks the strike at H.C. Frick Coat Company, and then he also breaks another strike at Duquesne. They are also having problems over at the Edgar Thompson Steelworks, and the Pinkertons are brought in to break the strike and the union that existed there. And so we're really starting to see Frick's heavy hand uh, come into play. And, you know, while all of this is going on, a lot of the time Andrew's overseas, and the relationship between Andrew and Frick is becoming a little uh, difficult, mostly because Frick is starting to see himself as Andrew's equal. And Andrew is offering Frick a lot of unsolicited advice, and Frick really doesn't want to hear it. Just to kind of expand on that a little bit, Andrew really wanted to mentor Frick, and Frick is like, hey, I'm running your business. He's like, I'm a grown man. You're just the rich guy behind the business. I'm running it. I don't need your advice. Yeah, it's kind of interesting that Andrew's overseas having a good time, and Frick is literally in the firing line, making the tough calls. Yeah, but like, I don't think he would have wanted it any differently. I no, think Frick no. seems to really have enjoyed this. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I mean, for him, for being the ambitious businessman that he is, I mean, I think that he saw this naturally as, this is my opportunity to show that I'm the, you know, the best businessman in the United States or something like that. And Carnegie kind of has reason to believe that he 
is the best Mrs. Man in the United States. You know, he is absolutely crushing it right now. And as steel has continued to expand, we're talking now into like the, you know, we're in the 1890s and Carnegie's business is just exploding. And like we've been talking about, we talk about government contracts and that sort of stuff. But whereas his business had been primarily concentrated on rails and bridges before, he started moving into the global market. And one of the tactics that I thought was at least worth mentioning that he used to crush competition at home was by participating in these legally murky pools. So basically, there would be a product, say, rail. These steel companies would come together and agree that, you know, we're not going to sell steel rails below X dollars. And everyone would agree to do that. Now, remember the way that Andrew ran his business was that he held very little debt. And so he was able to withstand a lot of economic downturns. And we've already seen in previous episodes, the nature of the railroad industry is super volatile at this point. And so what he would do is he would sit there in these pools with all his cash and no debt while these smaller companies are still trying to come up and expand. So they're borrowing money all the time. And he would wait for an economic downturn. And now he can take it because he's got all his cash behind him, but they can't necessarily. And so he would wait for an economic downturn, just as all of his competitors really needed that price assurance. And he would be like, you know what, guys, I know we had this agreement about how much we were going to charge, but I'm going to undercut you by a lot. And then he would scoop up all the business. These guys would have to shutter their windows and he would just take over market share. That is one of the tactics that he used to grow to the size that he did. And some of you may be wondering, but Arif, but Melvin, what about the Sherman Antitrust Act? What is the Sherman Antitrust Act? In short, the Sherman Antitrust Act broadly prohibits anti-competitive agreements and unilateral conduct that monopolizes or attempts to monopolize the relevant market. So basically, it was just a piece of legislation that was passed during the Harrison administration to encourage competition within industries. So, you know, it would kind of follow that what Carnegie was doing in these pools violated it, but it actually probably didn't. The language in the Sherman Antitrust Act, when it was passed, forbade, in quotations, combinations in the form of a trust or otherwise in restraint of trade. But it didn't make clear what restraint of trade meant. So it was actually pretty difficult to defend in court. And actually, these informal pulls that Carnegie was involved in probably were kosher under the Antitrust Act. And actually, the Supreme Court ruled that it didn't even apply to manufacturing in 1895. That decision was overturned in 1898. But as of 1895, which is before when we're talking about here, he was probably completely fine. So, you know, that takes us to November 1891. Carnegie celebrates his 56th birthday, and he's on top of the world. He's in great health. He's got a great marriage, great career in steel and writing. He's got a Republican in the White House. He's got Frick at the helm in Pittsburgh, and he is in the spotlight. And the spotlight is about to get real hot. Things are going good for Andrew, but unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you want to look at it, the battle for Homestead, 1892, the sort of event that they had been preparing for, since 1889, is just about to touch off. It was much more troublesome than I think Frick or Andrew had anticipated. So as I said before, they had been preparing for this uh, ever since 1889. And this sort of begins at the same time when Andrew is leaving for Scotland. He sends out the notice that Homestead, the Edgar Thompson, and the Duquesne Steelworks are going to be consolidated into Carnegie Steel. Now, normally this wouldn't be a problem, but in this consolidation, they make the decision that the new steel work is going to be non-union. Yeah. Carnegie so, Steel is not a union shop. Right. So all of these unions, you know, who, which union do we have right now? It's the... That's so hard to keep track of. Them. It's not the amalgamated. It's it might the, still be the amalgamated at Duquesne, but I'm just guessing because it, again, it's, it's different really, at each place. Right. It's hard. And there's often more than one at each place. So there were several unions. <laughs> right. And... Andrew makes sure that Frick is well-positioned to handle this. So Frick is made the third highest stakeholder behind Andrew and Phibbs. And on Saturday, June 25th, Frick let everyone know that there was going to be no negotiations in regards to negotiating the union situation and negotiating with the workers. So basically, he ends up locking everyone out. They batten down the hatches for battle. You could look at this situation and be like, oh, why didn't they want to negotiate or whatever? But this was always going to be a conflict. Like, this was going to be a conflict from 1899. Andrew made the decision back then 
that he was done with these unions. And so it was always going to happen. And from the workers' perspective, it was always going to happen. These people lived in company towns that the entire economy of revolved around these steelworks and the fact that these guys were union and they had steady jobs. And so when you take it away from them, you are slicing off a chunk of their identity and also their ability to provide for their family. Because if it is not like, oh, you know, I work in one industry and I can just retool and go work for another industry in town. Like you live in this town, you work for this company. And the other interesting thing is, you know, at this point in time in American history, for your average worker, this wasn't, let's just pack up and move to another town. You had laid roots there and it wasn't easy to just go a town over and get a new job, and take care of your family. Uh, so this was, for the workers, as close to life or death without being life or death, for some of them, as you could get. That's important to keep in mind as we talk about what happens next with the Pinkertons, but this really was life or death for these people. Yeah, so what Frick does is he decides that he's going to call in the, the Pinkertons because they need to, A, protect the facilities and protect the, the guys that they're going to come in, the what we call them, scabs. Yeah, so they were workers who had agreed to work for non-union wages or whatever. And sometimes these scabs were kept on long-term, but oftentimes they were just kept for the uh, duration of the strike. Yeah, so the Pinkertons are supposed to come in, right, by boat. Uh, yeah, and this is such a mess, too. In the middle of the night, right? But yeah, by barge. But the union workers are so, they're, they're pretty well organized, uh, and they're keeping, keeping an eye out for these guys. And when they hear and see uh, that they're on their way, they kind of like the Minutemen, get the boys together, and then they head out. And the Pinkertons being pretty good strike breaker guys, but they get handled. Yeah, well, they're trapped on their barge. The workers come down to the dock, and they're like, you're not landing. And so like, they're basically, it's kind of like shooting fish in a barrel. Yeah. So they exchange fire, and several on both sides die, and it really becomes like a huge national kerfuffle. Yeah, um, and there's, <laughs> there's, you know, some of the newspapers, they have so, sometimes exaggerated accounts. It was a big deal, and I think this is one of the first times where Andrew, learning about all this stuff, is like, oh, God. And real quick before we move on, I think two things I'm sure were terrifying in real time but are kind of funny to look back in hindsight are that the workers in an attempt to bring down the, the Pinkertons in, instead of just exchanging gunfire, someone had gotten a hold of a Civil War era cannon and was trying to shoot the barge with this cannon. Oh, God. And at another point, they tried to set the river on fire <laughs> around the barge. So things had gotten, obviously, a little out of control. And it got so bad that the governor eventually calls in the militia um, to take possession of Homestead from the Union because, you know, the Pinkertons couldn't get off their boat and they couldn't take possession of homestead and when they do eventually get off their boat it's at the hands of the workers so you know the evening of july 6th the pinkertons surrender and this must have been terrifying because you had just been involved in an incident yeah they killed one of the workers that had i think more than one died yeah. uh, one of the workers died and so like there was blood on the hands of the pinkertons as a whole and so these people had surrendered and they're basically led to the opera house in the middle of the town, they had people throwing stuff at them. People were just running out and punching them and stuff like that. And so they really couldn't like fend themselves. They just had to like cover up and, and try to get there. And then that's when like the sheriff and the deputies and stuff came in to basically escort them out of town. So while all of this is going on, again, Andrew's overseas in Scotland. And he is being really quiet about this. <laughs> He's like, I don't know what's happening, guys. Right. And that's basically his line. He's pleading the fifth. He's like, you know, Frick is in charge. I'm just a, a stakeholder over here, minding my own business. Whatever's going on over there, you got to talk to Frick. And as Melvin has already said, while all this is going on, Andrew is away. He is at a wonderful, isolated hunting lodge on Loch Rannoch in Scotland. And he's very intentionally keeping himself out of this stuff. He's not talking to the media. And when he does, he's saying that, he was totally uninformed about the decision-making going on in regards to the bloody incident and that now he was in constant communication to try to make things right and all that. So he's basically trying to spin himself as, as completely out of the loop when it came to decision-making, and now he's coming back in to try to make things better. The British press absolutely had a field day with him because you know he was very outspoken in Europe about all kinds of issues, and now he's beginning to look sort of hypocritical, and so they really enjoyed that. Back in the United States, Frick is still 
dealing with the aftermath of all this on the ground. And a young man on Saturday, July 23rd, a young self-proclaimed anarchist named Alexander Berkman busts in to Frick's office claiming that he worked for a New York hiring agency and just busts through the door, pulls out a pistol, shoots Frick twice, and then gets tackled by, I believe Frick was meeting with another person. And so they, Frick had been shot, but still manages to like get after the guy. They get him on the ground. Berkman pulls out a knife and stabs him three times before a carpenter who was nearby comes over with a hammer and hits the guy in the head, did not kill him, but uh, managed to subdue him enough. And so, you know, here is Frick having been shot twice, stabbed three times, still kicking. And he actually ends up recovering, though. I mean, it was a slow recovery, but, you know, this kind of was just one part of a rough summer for Henry Frick because he has that that he's dealing with being almost murdered and his wife. She almost died giving birth to Henry Frick Jr., who was born, I believe, prematurely, and who actually did end up dying. So there was a lot going on for Henry Frick, and Andrew knew that all this was going on, and he was really worried about Frick because, you know, he did like Frick. He considered Frick kind of like a mentee, but he was also concerned that all of this was going to affect his ability to run the company. I was going to say, I mean, Frick's response to, like, getting shot, his child dying, things like that, was to kind of work harder. Yeah. Like, that was his, he just... Threw himself into it. Right. And, yeah, Andrew was worried that he was going to basically kill himself uh, by working himself to death. But, you know, for all of the worry that he had for Frick, Andrew was also not happy with how Frick managed the homestead strike. Uh, he thought it was an absolute mistake to call in the Pinkertons and that Frick had rushed to sort of bring in these scabs. Now. Frick was under the impression that this showdown was going to happen at some point. It might as well happen early and now. And Andrew, just being away, didn't necessarily agree with that. And he did his best to distance himself from the company, because at this time he was trying to emphasize to the media that he was retired, you know? He wasn't calling the shots. Even though, based on the exchanges that the author brings up, it's clear that Andrew was still sort of at least involved in the decision-making process. It wasn't just Frick right. uh, making all the calls. But during this time, he, he publishes the second edition of Triumphant Democracy. Because some interesting views. Yeah, and this is kind of crazy because he argues that the United States and the UK should come back together. Yeah, I forget what terminology he used, but he saw the people of the United Kingdom and the United States as one race. Well, he often talks about like, the English speaking world. Yeah. Like the English speaking race. Yo, I'm I'm down for it. It's just weird. It's just like a weird thing to bring up. Could you imagine like the United States of the Kingdom of Well yeah, what do we even what do we United even... Kingdom States. United Kingdom States. Was that UKS? No. Bro, I'm down. Where's our king president at? That's a good question. They have to live on a boat in the Atlantic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yeah, so he's calling for a reunification of the, the U.S. and the U.K., but in November of 1892, after 4.5 months of battling, the 2,000 workers that had uh, been fighting for their union lives now return back to the works non-union. So ultimately, you know, we can say what we want about Frick's tactics. In the end, they won out, but it cost a lot. You know, Andrew and the business itself took a lashing in the media. The Republicans blamed him for Cleveland's victory uh, in that presidential election. And this is probably what hurt Andrew the most, was that people started to question his philanthropic endeavors. Yeah, kind of how we've brought up how strange it is that he was very philanthropic on one hand and then very tight-fisted when it came to his employees. You know, that's not a an original criticism from Melvin and I. That is a criticism that has been going on since right after the strike. <laughs> it's interesting to think about him talking about everything that he wanted to give to the working man, but it was the emphasis that he had to give it to them. Rather than providing them sort of the means to, you know, giving them high enough wages and letting them work eight hours instead of 12, it was like, I'm going to get as much out of you guys as I can, and then, you know, later on I'll give you a library or something like that. But now, you know, he's sort of where he had enjoyed being a figure that was covered positively by U.S. labor groups. 
Now he's kind of the boogeyman to U.S. labor groups and labor groups in the U.K. Who really liked him because he had a lot of anti- aristocratic stances right he was much more pro-labor in the uk than he was in the u.s i guess because it didn't really hurt his business so now he's he's lost that glow you know he's just another one of these head honchos you know but despite taking the press beating business is good things over at homestead was it was paying out enormous dividends from the business perspective yeah so breaking these unions really increased the carnegie steel margins, but it also kind of marked the end of Carnegie's, I don't want to call it connection to Pittsburgh, but he becomes much less involved in the business and in Pittsburgh. He didn't go back often after this whole thing happened. And he really kind of started to wear those rose colored glasses a lot more. He would talk about the fact that, you know, he always took pride in the fact that his workers had the ability to rise to the ranks of the company and all that. But really by this time, the people who they were hiring due to a lot of technological advances and stuff like that, that they would buy this new equipment that required less actually skilled workers. They were hiring cheap laborers who didn't really have any sort of upward mobility in the company. So following chronologically, we are now in the 1893 to 1895 period, but we need to back up a little bit and talk about the Sherman Silver Purchase Act which was a United States federal law enacted on July 14th, 1890. In a nutshell, there was a lot of people who wanted the United States to start moving towards a silver standard instead of gold standard. There were people with, there were companies, I should say, with a lot of debt that were having trouble paying that debt back because it was on a gold standard, so that money was more valuable. And so they wanted the United States to move towards a silver standard or like a mixed standard to cheapen the value of the debt that they owed back. So basically, they would be able to pay back their debt more quickly. And so the United States passed this Sherman Silver Purchase Act that basically set a standard that the United States government would purchase X amount of pounds or whatever the measure was of silver over the next however many years. Now, this crashed the economy because a lot of banks in Europe who owned government bonds or company bonds in the United States saw this as a step toward removing the United States from the gold standard. And so they basically cashed out and basically took all their gold with them. And so there was this giant outflow of gold from the United States into Europe. And at the same time, this coincided with Western mines finding more and more silver. And so there were just these two forces that basically caused a ton of deflation. And this crashed the U.S. economy. This was kind of old hat for Carnegie at this point, because of the way he ran his business, he was hurt, but not nearly as bad as his competition. So in the long run, this actually ended up allowing him to gain even more market share. And a lot of this had to do too with the fact that along with carrying little debt, he had always made sure that the equipment that his company used to produce was always top of the line. And so they were able to produce cheaper and cheaper while their companies were struggling just to survive. Winter 1894, Andrew decides to do what was very popular among the elite at this time, and it was to go and visit Egypt. One thing I thought was interesting, too, was that around this time, you know, he had homes in the United States and New York and in London. And in New York, he lived in, you know, in quotations, like modesty. It's like it's relative to the amount of wealth that he had. He lived in a pretty modest home, but not in London. He was like very ostentatious in and, and London. And I wonder if that was intentional on his part to, to kind of like take away from the image of Andrew Carnegie, the robber baron in New York. So, right. you know, he continues to micromanage Frick. Eventually, he's in Scotland for a large part of his time away, and he is constantly writing to Frick, like, hey, come visit. Hey, you want to come visit? Hey, you want to come out? Come hang out and golf with me at Clooney. That's where his property was in, in Scotland. And finally, Frick is like, fine. And he goes, and he doesn't stay for very long, but he goes nonetheless. And around this time, like, they're still... They are being Carnegie and Carnegie Steel is getting absolutely hammered in the press. There's a report that comes out that alleges that they had produced some faulty steel plating that had endangered thousands of sailors' lives. And there's all this stuff going on. And this kind of contributed to Andrew trying to distance himself more and more from the company that bore his name. And uh, that was no easy task, you know? It's Carnegie Steel. But he kept trying to push Frick into the limelight. No, look, our representative is Frick. Leave me alone in Scotland. I'm trying to golf. Something bad happened? Go talk to Frick. Exactly. Frick, meanwhile, was just trying to run the business. Like, he wasn't interested in the publicity and all that jazz. One thing that really hurt their relationship 
you know, like we talked about the fact that they didn't have a great relationship in the first place. But one thing that really pushed Frick over the edge was that once Andrew and Louise returned to the United States, November of 1894, he starts talking to one of Frick Coke's competitor called the Rainy Coke Company. And he starts talking to them about merging them with Frick's Coke Company. And even though Andrew had every right in the world to do this, he was the majority stakeholder in Frick Coke. Coke was like, no, wait a minute. This is my baby. I made this. Don't. The way that he looked at it was that you know a lot about, you know, the steel side of this. But in terms of the Coke, that's my, that's my thing. That's my territory. And I think that what really set him off was that really showed the way that Andrew saw him, not as an equal, but as another one of his sort of subordinates that he could go behind at any time that he wanted. Yeah, and that just pushed him over the edge. So he resigned as the CEO or president or whatever his title was at Carnegie Steel at that point, but he stayed on as chairman of the board. And Andrew, now 60 years old in 1895-1896, finally steps back into the limelight. And his means of doing this was to open a library and a museum of natural history in Pittsburgh. Andrew had this you know, at this point in time where he's spending so much time away from Pittsburgh, he still had a tremendous amount of pride in the city and was in an odd way attached to it. And he wanted the city to be known for more than just steel manufacturing. He didn't want people to think of it as just the soot city uh, where steel comes from. So he puts in a natural history museum. And what does he absolutely want? Any natural, good natural history museum at the time had to have a dinosaur. dinosaur. <laughs> what, what kind of, do we know what dinosaur it was? I think it was actually named after him. A Carnegosaurus? Something like that. that <laughs> that's what we're going to go with. But the interesting thing is, like, obviously this is the late 19th century. You can get dinosaurs, but it's not all that easy. So they have to find a university out west, right, who's already found the dinosaur. They approach said university. They go through a little bit of legal trouble. But in the end... Carnegie finally gets his dinosaur for his natural history museum. Have you ever been to any of the Carnegie museums or whatever in Pittsburgh? I have not. I've actually never set foot in Pittsburgh. Hmm. Well, if you ever do, I highly recommend them. As a Youngstown person, I spent a lot of time going to Pittsburgh and checking those museums out as a young child. Did you guys have field trips? Did they put you in buses there? I don't remember if we went for school. I don't think we did. But my mom took me several times. And actually, as an adult, I've gone a few times, too. How far is Pittsburgh from the YG? No, it's like 45 minutes. It's not far really? at all. That close? Yeah, we're right over the border. Anyway, taking us to June 1896, we've got a bit of a situation on our hands, as far as Andrew is concerned, because he is seeing the young, upstart, rising star of the Democratic Party, Williams Jennings Bryan, take on a platform of getting off the gold standard. Now. This was utter lunacy to Andrew. He thought it was completely irresponsible. To him, leaving the gold standard was basically just asking to ruin the United States economy. And he never thought that Brian was going to beat McKinley, even though it was, it was a close call. Because not to get too far off on a tangent, what you kind of saw with that election was the young, the new face. Brian was often referred to as the great commoner because he ran on a platform of the common man and that sort of thing. And he's young upstart, handsome guy. And you've got McKinley, on the other hand, who is the face of the old guard, the establishment. He's the last president to have served in the Civil War. He's old enough to have served as like just an enlisted soldier and rose to the ranks that way, fighting for the Union. He's just a kid from Akron. And they are clashing over this currency issue because McKinley firmly wanted to stay on the gold standard. And again, Carnegie never thought that McKinley was really going to lose. He did pump a lot of money into his campaign, but he was more concerned over the fact that they had made an issue like currency political, which he thought was absolutely ridiculous. It was like, why isn't it obvious to both sides that this is bad for the United States, period? McKinley did win, but just as he said, down the road, the United States does come off the gold standard. So a bit of prescience on Carnegie's side. We've talked before about John D. Rockefeller. We mentioned him in an earlier episode, we're absolutely going to cover his biography at some time. 
but he and Carnegie didn't really like have a great relationship at this point. Not that they disliked each other, but they were like kind of adjacent competitors. They were in industries that were adjacent to each other and they were both, you know, basically by this point vying for the makings of the richest man in the world. And Carnegie actually bought the Masabi iron mines to prevent Rockefeller from getting a total monopoly. And he was really doing this to try to deal with Rockefeller, like he was basically buying chips to bring to the table to, to negotiate. And, and it's funny, in all the correspondence, he refused to spell Rockefeller's name correctly. He always spelled it Rockefeller and, uh, <laughs> and, and just like weird variations. That is so petty. <laughs> yeah. But basically, the deal they ended up cutting was that Carnegie agreed to buy all of Rockefeller's iron at a great discount for the guarantee that it would be shipped by rail or steam via all of Rockefeller's companies. And the two of them actually ended up developing a relatively friendly relationship. They often exchanged gifts and wrote back and forth. I'm rich. You're rich. Let's, Let's be friends. Yeah. <laughs> and then Carnegie went on to renegotiate his rates with the Pennsylvania Railroad. And I feel like we just keep saying how profitable Carnegie Steel was. But again, he just takes it to a whole other level right now. They're making so much money. They have deals that producing this steel is extremely cheap and they're able to basically they've priced other people out of the market it's just like they're absolutely making money hand over fist and this naturally trickles down to the workers right? well it's supposed to because they're on a sliding scale we remember the sliding scale deal mm -hmm. that they have where you know increased profits for the company meant increased wages for the workers it just for whatever reason doesn't work out didn't happen yeah and so it's just like the profits go up workers wages continue to decline now um, now now we have to remember, this is so that Andrew can accumulate said wealth to do great things later That's right, in life. To give it away. Right. Now, speaking of later in life, Andrew's life is about to take a serious turn. That turn was children. Or more specifically, a child. March 30th, 1897, Luis gave birth to their first and only child, Margaret Carnegie. Now, it's kind of crazy to think about this, that Luis was 40 when she gave birth. And the more I think about it, having a child that late in the late 19th century was probably highly risky. As a matter of fact, she was sick for a long time after uh, giving birth. She definitely could have lost her life. Yeah, but we've also seen Carnegie's ability to basically hire an entire hospital staff. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, risky, absolutely, but probably less risky than your average yeah. You know, person. Giving Steel worker. Them. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so as soon as Louise was strong enough, you know, they left for Scotland. And a lot of the homes that the Carnegies had been staying in before, they had been sort of renting them or leasing them. This time, Andrew wanted to buy something. They wanted to put down roots. And he also wanted a yacht, oddly enough. Hey, you're going to deny a man his yacht? Because <laughs> the funny thing is when they traveled to Scotland, you know, with this fairly new born baby. It was probably just a few months old mm -hmm. uh, by this point in time. They had to have all of the best amenities on the ship. So they like had an entire level of the ship to themselves with a, with a suite I and mean, all the comforts of home. But yeah, they want to buy a home and you know, they're looking at Scotland and the place that they settle on is a place called Skibo. But unfortunately, the place is in total disrepair. Uh, so there's going to have to be a lot of work that the Carnegie's are going to have to put into it to get it up to speed. The interesting thing is that they had like workers that lived on the land. Yeah. Uh, kind of like, they had, like tenants. Yeah. The, the remains of like feudal, you know, feudal. serfs <laughs> that had just been there, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so they've got to like take these people on, rebuild some of the buildings. Uh, so there, there's a lot of work, but the price was good because they, they wanted to get rid of it. And initially Carnegie, he was a little uneasy about it. So they leased it, I believe, for a year first before they made the final decision to ultimately purchase it, get it up to speed, and it's going to be the new home base for the Carnegie clan. So then kind of heading back to the political realm, around this time, there is the break of the Spanish-American War and kind of this era of American imperialism. That's as... kind of hard to think about because we usually don't associate those two words together. And... I don't know, man. I mean, it's kind of hard to argue. It is, but if you walk up to the average person on the street and say, American Empire, they're like, what are you talking about? Yeah, I guess you're right. Get I out probably, of your I bubble, Aleph. I know, I'm in, my, I'm in my ivory... Academic. I'm in my ivory tower with Melvin. Looking down at the, the peasants. Well, you're looking down at the peasants, yeah. Melvin. I'm in an ivory hut. 
you're up <laughs> you're an ivory tower but anyway so this whole idea of like american imperialism you know you have your classical imperialism which is like having colonies and you know the british in india and kind of everywhere but the whole idea of american imperialism kind of is that like, informal we, empire exactly dress it, dress it down yeah like we didn't have like formal colonies but like hey we kind of ended up with hawaii and <laughs> Hawaii is such a great place let's not talk about i'm that. just saying there's just there's a lot of imperialist light activity yeah. that goes on so i mean the spanish-american war right. we end up at war with spain and you know basically what we end up doing at the end of this war is taking on some of spain's old colonial possessions as protectorates right so well i mean what do we, we get cuba and really important for our discussion here the philippines all this to say carnegie is vehemently opposed he thought that the united states should absolutely stay out of any kind of imperialist stuff because for carnegie this is what separated us from the europeans that's right and <laughs> i thought this was funny he like openly told through the press called for soldiers to refuse to fight, which may or may not have been treason. Uh, <laughs> He's walking a very thin line. Right. So may or may not have committed treason. And then he goes, I was going to say goes further, but I don't know if you can go further than treason, but he turns around and he starts attacking his own party, which really rubbed some of them the wrong way. So we've got Andrew basically fighting his own party slash his own country kind of. Fall 1898, he decides that he might be willing to sell his stake in Carnegie Steel if there was a right buyer, someone who could actually afford, which is kind of the problem at this point is there's really, there's only two people who he could think of who would be willing to, or who had the means to buy from, and that's Rockefeller and J.P. Morgan, and neither of them were interested at that point. So Frick tries to arrange a deal where this shady stock manipulator guys were going to try to like arrange the sale and it really ends up backfiring on Frick because basically Andrew says, I'm not comfortable with them, so you will have to come up with, like they'll have to front me some cash. And Frick puts up that cash and the deal falls through and Frick kind of assumes that, okay, Andrew didn't lose any money, so like he'll just give me my cash back and he doesn't. If their relationship <laughs> if their relationship was in a bad place before, it was in the lowest place it could go. That now. is amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I just put up like a million dollars and then you come back like, hey, so the deal didn't go through. Can I get my money back? And Andrew's like, What money? We had a deal. Yeah, what what I don't remember the actual amount that Frick lost, but it was not a uh, inconsequential amount. Oh my god. Not okay, so I think that part for me when I was reading the document uh, the biography caught myself this time, Eric was a, a little fuzzy, but now I totally get it. Because Frick starts attacking Andrew in board meetings. And you can see this in the company minutes. And basically, things just start disintegrating from, from there. It gets so bad, you know, Frick is basically backhandedly talking about how bad of a businessman Carnegie is, which is kind of interesting because it's Carnegie's company. And he ultimately, things get bad enough that Frick resigns on December 5th, 1899. Andrew, you know, he was still kind of high on Frick. He still kind of saw him as like a protege, tries to talk him out of this. And Frick just, again, loses it, which puts the nail in Frick's coffin at the company. And Andrew moves to basically remove him from the company and have everybody kind of buy him out. Now, per their partnership agreement, Frick was paid for his 6% of the book value of the company. So he owned 6%. Well, yes, you're right. He owned 6%. But he's getting the book value, not the actual value. Right. So this goes back to their, quote unquote, ironclad agreement that they had made when the partnership was originally formed way back when. It was basically so that if a partner left, they couldn't demand that the other partners pay them like huge swaths of cash. So here's my question. Is that legal? Because my understanding is that the book agreement, like the book value of the company is what they listed, right? Right. But they actually knew that the company was valued at much more than that. Well. Only valued to them. So they were cooking the books. I can't speak to the legality of it. I mean, they do wonky things with books now that are presumably legal, but I have no idea what it was like then. So the basic point is that the quote unquote book value of this company was way, way, way lower than what its assets and how much money it actually brought in would have made it actually worth. Because this is so that they can easily buy their partners out. Exactly. So long story short, Frick gets his 6%, but of the low-balled value of the company, 
So he really doesn't, you know, in those last kind of years of dealing with Carnegie, he kind of gets screwed. Yeah, so I have a note in my notebook that based on the terms of that agreement, Frick received $5 million, which is 6% of the $75.6 million book value of the company, whereas he should have really received closer to between 15 and 30 million because the c- the company was valued as conservatively around 300 million really <laughs> and they but on the books it was 75 million exactly wow yeah now you know frick knows this and he's not going to go quietly into the night no so when he leaves he sues carnegie steel and there's a massive media frenzy and you know the the crazy thing about this is that frick is putting out sort of private information in the sort of stuff that he's leaking to the media. One of the most sensitive things that Frick leaks to the media and to the outside world is how much Carnegie Steel is actually making in profits. Uh, He puts it out there that they're making $40 million annually, and that is a monstrous amount of money. And to make matters worse, he also explains that most of the profits that the company is getting is actually tariff exempt because of these sort of sweetheart deals that they had made with the federal government. So the company's making money hand over fist, and now people have an idea of exactly how much and how big this company actually is. Yeah, and Andrew was not thrilled about having all of his business dragged into the spotlight. And so they really needed to make this go away as quickly as possible. So what they ended up doing to resolve the whole issue was that they reorganized all of the company's holdings into the Carnegie Company and gave Frick $31 million worth of shares of that company. And so he then dropped the lawsuit. So before you keep going, I want to just take a moment to imagine you're one of the workers at Carnegie Steel (laughs) and you find out the company is worth like three or four times what you thought it was worth and that they're bringing in way more money than anybody had ever imagined. Sliding scale. And you're like, my wages went down for the last five years. I don't understand. (laughs) Oh. Yeah. But this really was basically the end of Carnegie and Frick's relationship. They were not super friendly after that. Yo, but this guy to Carnegie fired up. He was like, I need to show the world that I am the man. It wasn't Frick that was getting us all this money. It was me, Andrew Carnegie. Now, as this whole lawsuit is carrying on, steel prices are falling across the United States due to an oversupply. Uh, There had been a period of more and more people getting into the steel game, and they were making more steel. Like Melvin said, after this whole lawsuit got resolved, Andrew wanted to show the people that he still had the magic touch. And so he decided that he was going to build a state-of-the-art tube works, which was going to produce gigantic rolled steel tubes. Now, this was kind of an issue because it was going to put him directly in competition with J.P. Morgan. I should really say indirectly in competition with J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan had companies and stocks and companies and stuff who already did this. And, you know, JP didn't want those problems. He knew better than to go toe-to-toe with Carnegie. Even if he thought that his companies could fare, he knew how much money Carnegie had behind him, which was kind of the same situation Rockefeller had been in when the whole iron mines thing came about. He was like, yes, we could go toe-to-toe, but that would be a war of attrition. And I think both of them realized that Carnegie had some sort of sick, he took some sick pleasure out of going into these battles. You know, where I think the other businessmen realized, they were like, oh, this is just bad for business. I don't want any part of it. Carnegie was like, I want to just crush my enemies and see how I can do it. He had that gladiatorial mindset. But anyway, Morgan, who had known now company president Charles Schwab, who, so when the company was formed to give Frick the shares to basically go away, Charles Schwab, who you may know from the insurance company, I believe, Schwab, mm-hmm. Schwab Investments or Schwab Insurance, whatever, the same guy, he was now the company president. And he's got an interesting story too because he, came up. He's an, a Carnegie protege. He started very young with Carnegie Steel, and he worked his way up to the top to basically, by this point, he's Carnegie's number two. And you know we're not going to go too deep into his story, but later in life, he founds his own steel company called Bethlehem Steel, which becomes the number two biggest steel producer in the United States. But anyway, he enters talks with Morgan, and he acts as this 
go between, and they come to an agreement that Andrew would sell the Carnegie Company to J.P. Morgan for four hundred million dollars, which is the equivalent of more than two hundred billion dollars today. Andrew received two hundred twenty-six million dollars, making him the richest man in the world. That is the equivalent of one hundred twenty billion today. He immediately then set out to fulfill his gospel of wealth and started giving away large sums, mostly, especially in the early days, in the form of public libraries across Pittsburgh and New York City. So Andrew is now the richest man in the world. All things should be rosy. But after leaving the company, Andrew experiences kind of a deep depression. It would be weird because definitely for his entire adult life, this had been so much a part of who he was. That was his baby. And now it's gone. And I also think he had a weird sort of outlook in that he saw himself, despite the fact of being like the boss and having all of this money, he saw himself as one of the guys, you yeah. know, like he really did believe he was like another one of the workers, one of the guys on the line. And now he had to step away from that. He didn't have the good old boys to exchange the letters with and keep him occupied anymore. Now he just has world leaders, <laughs> world leaders in time. So he needed something to occupy himself with, and he really went hard into the philanthropic endeavors that he had sort of talked about wanting to do before retirement. One of the things that he establishes, and this is in early 20th century, so 1901, uh, he says he establishes the Carnegie Trust for the Universities of Scotland. Now, initially, Andrew had hoped to provide free college education to everyone in Scotland, which is a lofty goal. But what he ultimately ends up doing is paying for half of the student tuition at four Scottish universities, and that's St. Andrews, Aberdeen, Edinburgh, and Glasgow. Uh, so he's able to pay for half of the tuition at those universities, which I think he donated, what, like $5 billion? Yeah, the equivalent of $5 billion today. Yeah, man. And he also, the trust continues to fund technical schools, and research institutions to this day in Scotland, which is amazing. But I guess, hey, when you donate the equivalent of $5 billion, that better last. That's one thing that's really cool about a lot of the philanthropy that came out of Carnegie is that almost all the stuff that we're going to talk about still is in existence today. Yeah. And he also gave a little bit, or should I say a lot, in the United States. The Ivy Leagues had been <laughs> knocking at his door for a long time, but Carnegie understood that the Ivy League schools, they were big enough. They didn't need Carnegie's money. So actually, he, what he ends up doing is setting up some smaller schools, some smaller institutes around the country, and he establishes the Carnegie Institute for the Sciences, which, where's that low? Is that in? Uh, it's in D.C., I believe. In D.C. Or at least it was originally. And the really cool thing about this was that this was one of those special places in that the people who worked there only had to do research. It was basically fully funded, come on in, and do some good for humanity. Yeah, make scientific advancements. That's your job. Yeah. So, I mean, he was really pouring money into philanthropic endeavors. He was also pouring money into his new home in Skibo. His castle. Yeah, so he, we talked about before that he had bought this estate, and one of the things that they decided to do to bring it up to speed was to build what essentially is a castle. And it finally, after all of this time, after a, probably a few years now, is ready for them to move in, and the family does. And it's funny the way that Nassau describes it. To call it a castle is probably still not doing it justice. It looks like something out of time. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like that shouldn't exist. But it's basically everything he ever wanted in a home. He had private lakes and stuff for him to fish on. There was we said he was an avid rider. He got plenty of room to ride his horses. He had his golf course there. Like, just can you imagine the library in that oh place? Oh my gosh, I'm sure it was enormous. So yes, the place where Andrew wanted to lay down his roots was finished and he was going, and that is the home where he lived for the rest of his life. On the political side of things, he expressed his discontent over the Second Boer War in South Africa, but on the political side of things in the United States, he wanted to get back into the good graces of the Republican Party. And he did so in a couple of different ways. He began by contributing to the re-election campaign for McKinley. He actually wasn't a huge Teddy Roosevelt fan at first. Teddy is someone who we're going to get into down the road. Might be the longest series that we ever do. But he didn't like Teddy's views on imperialism because 
Teddy was all about it and Carnegie was not, but they actually would end up growing closer together as time passed. McKinley ends up being assassinated. And that is how Teddy Roosevelt becomes a president before he's actually elected. And they spend a lot of time together forming the Carnegie Institution for Science. And they plan it together where it's going to be in Washington, the government's contribution to, to keep it up and running. And that's one thing that I think we should touch on at least briefly is that with a lot of the stuff that Andrew donated, he was happy to give the money, but he also believed that the government, either the federal government or the state's governments and some of these larger institutions, but the municipal governments in terms of like libraries and stuff should have a stake in the upkeep and that sort of thing for these libraries and institutions and stuff. So in the example of the libraries, Andrew was more than happy to give the money to establish them and to set up trust for their upkeep, but that was contingent upon the municipalities to agree to do the same thing. Because he, from an ideological perspective, believed that the government, at whatever level, should have a hand in making sure that the citizens were educated and all that. We're going to take a step back here to talk about Carnegie, the friend. You know, after Carnegie sold the company, he becomes one of the most famous people in the U.S. and in Western Europe. And he decides to go about publishing another draft of his Gospel of Wealth and some essays on anti-imperialism. But besides that, at this point, he has a, pretty much just time for friends. And he was a good friend. Yeah, he was extremely generous uh, as a friend, unlike Arif. Wow. <laughs> so Carnegie really takes to, you know, sending gifts and things like that uh, to all of his friends. Whenever some of his friends needed, you know, some money, he would establish pensions for some of them. That's the kind of friend I need. I need to quit hanging out with you. Mm -hmm. And find someone who's going to set up a pension for me. Right. It's like, hey, if you old and tired, I got you. I forget who it was, but he bought one of his friends like a library. Yeah. Like a legit library. Mm -hmm. There was one friend who, you know, was just like, I'm not feeling well. So Carnegie would just send him whiskey. Barrels of whiskey. Barrels like, of whiskey. This will help. Just, yeah. Like, I mean, that's how you got over a cold back then. And it wasn't that he just sent him one barrel of whiskey. He started sending him consistently one or two barrels of whiskey. Per year. Yeah. And this isn't like the bottom of the barrel gutter whiskey. This, this is divorce. The, the finest whiskey you can get at That's the true. time. He's always lending out gifts, buying people libraries, pensioning his friends. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, Carnegie, he was a great friend, especially yeah. during this time. Now, to move on to uh, one actually specific case of a friend that he had. This is uh, a man named Sam Clemens. Now, Arif, for those who don't know, like myself, who is Sam Clemens? First of all, you should be ashamed of yourself. The name that he is most widely recognized by is the writer Mark Twain, who I feel like 90% of the quotes you see on the internet have been attributed to him. But he is absolutely a hilarious writer. Oh, yeah. Um, I absolutely love reading stuff that he wrote. So, Melvin, I would like you to share a quote about how small <laughs> Andrew Carnegie is. Yeah, so or was. One of the weird things is during this time, people really started taking notice of how small Andrew was. Because and I think it, with he, age, you know, people kind of shrink. Yeah. yeah, he was like hunching over. So like he was already a small guy. Now he's nearly microscopic. And Twain, who is known for his wittiness and funny writing, actually wrote about how small Carnegie was in an unpublished section of his autobiography. So Melvin, would you like to share with us how small Andrew Carnegie was? <laughs> yeah. Twain writes, dwell for a moment upon Carnegie's stature. If one may call it that by such a large name, for the sake of future centuries. The future centuries will be glad to hear about this feature from one who actually looked upon it. In truth, Mr. Carnegie is no smaller than was Napoleon. He is no smaller than were several other men supremely renowned in history, but for some reason or other, he looks smaller than he really is. He looks incredibly small, almost unthinkably small. I do not know how to account for this. I do not know for what reason it is. And so, I have to leave it unexplained. Just one of the world's great mysteries. <laughs> Why does this man look smaller than he actually is? Right. Man. So funny. And you know what I love about that, too? It's like... You can relate? No. Oh. That is beautifully written. Oh, yeah. About a man's small stature. Right. Moving on from there, we have more of the things that Carnegie kind of turned into passion projects following the sale of his company. One thing that he really took pride in, and he actually called it the great event in my life is becoming Lord of Pittencrief. I'm probably mispronouncing that. I apologize to all the Scots listening. I think it's Pittencrief. Whatever. So there's a kind of like a funny backstory, I guess. 
behind this is one of those like getting back at them moments because the land had become the estate of a family, the Hunt family, and they were like new money. This is back in Dumfrimland. They expanded their estate by encroaching on Dumfrimland's common lands, like public land. Now, Andrew's grandfather and his uncle were both, you know, we talked about this in episode one, they were both very for the common man against this sort of thing. And so they pushed back on the Hunts. And so the Hunts banned the Morrisons from ever walking on their land again. This is the, these Morrisons and any other Morrisons that ever come again. One of the reasons that this was like a thing was that Malcolm, I think it's pronounced Canemore, he was king of Scots in like the 11th century. One of his towers was on their property. And so like one day a year, the hunts would allow people to come and like tour it and see it and that sort of stuff, but not the Morrisons. So it came up for sale and Andrew said, mine now. So not only did he, you know, allow people to tour the land on more than one day a year, he actually basically donated all the land to Dunfermline and turned it into a green space. Because by that time, Dunfermline, which back in Andrew's childhood was a, like a weaving town. Not there wasn't, a heavy industry. Right. There wasn't, there wasn't any soot. It was work done by the hands, not by machines. By this point, it had become industrialized, and there was a lot of soot and dirty. Can we call it Little Pittsburgh? We could, I guess. Sure, we'll call it Little, Little Pittsburgh. Pit. So he wanted to give people a place to go and enjoy the outdoors. And another passion project that Andrew had that we're not going to dive too deep into the details of, but by this point, being arguably the richest man in the world, he had unsurprisingly been rubbing elbows with many powerful people. And so he had friends on both sides of the Atlantic involved in government. And he was constantly, constantly pushing for peace deals. And he, he really wanted a system of arbitration for nations to bring their problems to because he believed it would prevent great wars from mm-hmm. breaking out. Which, not to uh, get ahead of ourselves, but. Hey, one's coming down the pipe. Yeah, great wars were a brewing. But not to get too far ahead of ourselves, we're, we're in 1905, 1906. Andrew's living his life, minding his business. But there's something that pops up called the Cassie Chadwick scandal. Now, Cassie Chadwick is a young lady living, I believe, somewhere in Ohio, the Cleveland area. She's been going around explaining to everyone, any banker who might listen, that she is the daughter of Andrew Carnegie. This is brilliant. Like, you know, from many moons ago. She's the illegitimate daughter. And she explains to them that, like, yes, I am my father's daughter. and he's... Why wouldn't you trust me with a loan? Right. So she's going from bank to bank, asking these banks for loans. And they're just like, this sounds right. Sure. Andrew Carnegie's daughter needs money. I got you. She, in a very short period of time, gets her hands on roughly a million dollars, which... 1905, 1906 is a lot of money, but it starts to uh, become clear that she's not Andrew Carnegie's daughter when she can't pay back any of the loans that she took out. This becomes a sort of national sensation, and I think most people at the time realize that this is not Andrew Carnegie's daughter, but nonetheless, they're bothering... Still like a media frenzy. Right. They're bothering Andrew with questions about this, and... Andrew never actually goes to Cleveland to take part in the trial. He, he basically just always says, I'm sick, I'm too old to travel, you guys handle it. I don't know exactly what happens. Well, it's funny because, like I said, she becomes a celebrity because this really was like a media frenzy. Yeah. This woman had defrauded these banks out of a oh, ton yeah. of money, and so she actually goes to prison for that in 1906, and mm-hmm. she was held at the Ohio State Penitentiary right here in Columbus, Ohio. The Ohio State Penitentiary. <laughs> That's right. Uh, <laughs> but eventually, she dies in prison. Oh, snap. Um, October 10th, 1907. Man, it got real. Yeah, it got real, real. Uh, but the real consequences for defrauding these banks. You know, she was very strategic in who she actually targeted with this fraud, right? Like, she didn't say that she was J.P. Morgan's daughter or uh, Rockefeller's daughter. She said that she was Andrew Carnegie's daughter, in part because the world knew that Andrew dabbled in the finer things when he was younger and had the company of many young women. So it was believable. And they also knew him as being a, by this point, fairly generous guy. Like he had shed a lot of that bad publicity that he had gained 10 years earlier. Mm -hmm. Uh, So he was kind of back in the limelight. He was kind of the darling of the media again. And so that kind of takes us to a couple more things that Carnegie tried to get behind and some things. 
more successful than others. One thing that didn't work out great was uh, the simplified spelling board. Now, Yo, there, were, there were some successes here. I'm all for this. Yeah, okay, so the, the idea behind it was, first of all, Carnegie, for as literate as he was, was a terrible speller, apparently. Like, just didn't care. Mm -hmm. He just spelled things the way they sounded and move along. I do that all the time. And so he was like, it doesn't make sense that some words are spelled differently in the UK than in the US. So he tried to get the, the simplified spelling board was an attempt to push to make that all, like, canon. That through was going to be spelled T-H-R-U. Color? We're, We're dropping at you. you. But, so the U is what stuck, right? Because mm -hmm. we don't have the U anymore. Right. But in Britain, mm -hmm. they still do. Yeah. So, I mean, some things did change. Like, out of this, through, for example, it is legitimate to spell through, T-H-R-U, in the United States. Is it? Yeah. So Somebody should tell my advisor that. Well, I mean, ivory tower guys don't really do that. Oh. But, but, you know, us commoners do. So, this worked a little bit not great. This also takes us to the establishment of the... Carnegie Hero Fund, which I think is really cool. This actually came out of the Hardwick Mine Disaster, which was just this giant mine collapse that um, these civilians had displayed extreme bravery in their rescue attempts. And so he was inspired by that to set up the Carnegie Hero Fund Commission. Um, it was established to recognize persons who perform extraordinary acts of heroism in civilian life in the United States and Canada, and to provide financial assistance for those disabled and to the dependence of those killed, saving or attempting to save others. People who get this also receive the Carnegie Medal and become eligible for scholarship aid and other benefits. So that was something that he set up, and it actually still operates today. People are still eligible to receive the Carnegie Medal and uh, receive assistance from the Carnegie Hero Fund, which I think is pretty cool. And, you know, we talked a little bit about TR, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, and how they kind of had a, the relationship initially was rocky, but it, grew into something fairly nice. But by 1905, 1906, it's starting to get rocky again. And this all stems from, you know, Andrew's tendency to give unsolicited advice. Carnegie also had a lot of critiques about Roosevelt's ideas of manly, martial virtues. They were at odds over a lot of things, but it really got to the point where uh, Roosevelt could not handle being around Carnegie anymore. And so I thought it was funny, this quote that I pulled out of the biography. This was Roosevelt's one of his confidants. He said that he had tried hard to like Carnegie, but it is pretty difficult. There is no type of man for whom I feel more contemptuous abhorrence than for the one who makes a god of mere money-making, and at the same time is always yelling out that kind of utterly stupid condemnation of war, which in almost every case springs from a combination of defective physical courage, of unmanly shrinking from pain and effort, and hopelessly twisted ideals. All the suffering from the Spanish War comes far short of the suffering preventable and non-preventable among the operators of the Carnegie Steelworks and among the small investors during the time that Carnegie was making his fortune. It is as noxious folly to denounce war per se as it is to denounce business per se. Unrighteous war is a hideous evil, but I am not at all sure that it is worse evil than business unrighteousness. Woo! Strong words. Throwing haymakers out here. That's right. Yo, that line about worshiping, making money, that is hard. And between 1908 and 1909, Andrew is elected to the executive board of the National Civic Federation. Now, this federation was sort of a collection of big business and uh, labor organizations. And the goal of the federation was to help reduce tensions between both parties, and to try to, you know, make sure things like uh, what happened in the, you know, in 1894 don't happen again. And to fight socialism. That was a big driving factor behind this. They wanted to have like a pseudo union that would keep the socialists out of the union. So the idea was like, we'll give them a little something, something to make sure that they don't go full, full rogue socialist on us. Yeah, that's how I understood it. Now, basically, Andrew, at this time, he's repairing his uh, reputation by working more closely with labor, but he's also, you know, basically bankrolling a lot of what's going on. You know, they basically uh, use them for funding at this point. Yeah, it's like nowadays you can pay a PR firm to scrub all your bad tweets. Can you really? Oh, yeah. Man, how, how, what kind of job do they do? <laughs> I'm like, I feel like once that stuff is... <laughs> what are you hiding, Melvin? Once it's out there, man, it's out there. All right, guys, go to Melvin's Twitter account. Yeah, check it out. I got like three tweets. Go back down. See him say unsavory things 2012 <laughs> yeah because i had a twitter 
Okay, so then <laughs> William Howard Taft wins the presidential election in 1908. And I thought this was really funny. It was just kind of those like, you got to be kidding me moments where Carnegie breaks from the Republican Party and basically comes out against the steel tariffs that had made him so wealthy. You know, it was like while he was making the money from these tariffs, he was all for it. But then as soon as he's no longer in the game, he's like, you know what, guys, these are unfair. This seems immoral. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So Taft was actually in favor of tariff reform, but the Republicans were just like, are you kidding me? And, you know, as Carnegie did, he continued to offer his services, though unwanted to Taft. And Taft kind of just took it because he was the richest man in the world. You know, just turn him away. Could be useful. (laughs) Right. Yeah, you definitely don't want him giving uh, money to your enemies. That's right. Uh, Now, between uh, 1908 and 1910, Andrew continued to give his money away to worthy causes. But he has so much money that it's actually hard. And I pray that one day I have this problem. (laughs) He donates money to Booker T. Washington School for Black People. And Andrew, by this point in time, had developed a great respect for Booker T. Washington, and he viewed him as the Moses and Joshua of his people. All rolled into one. And a sort of educational uh, genius. He also, you know, they both believed in the value of technical education. Yeah, and there's one note about Andrew struggling to give away all that money. It wasn't that he had too much money that he literally couldn't just give away. It was that he was pretty thorough about evaluating, Mm -hmm. you know, the merits of the money that he's giving away because he had a vision of the world that he wanted to see made through his donations, basically. Yeah, he wasn't walking around with wads of cash and, like, hitting homeless men in the face with them. Like, (laughs) his his thing was that... that's philanthropy. Like, if you think about the way that he looked at giving the money to the workers outright, like, raising their wages, like, his idea was, you're just going to go take this to the local pub and drink it away, which should have been there right. But he firmly believed that it was his job to sort of curate where this money goes to make sure that it is best used by building libraries and natural history museums, things like that. Now, you know, you're giving away most of your money, but nothing brings you back down to earth than the realities of death. And more and more of Andrew's friends are just dying off. And Margaret was also sick for quite some time. Yeah, she had like a weird situation where she was basically like forced to wear a leg brace for years she'd been sick and then she'd injured her leg and like couldn't recover but finally around this time she was like able to move around and be healthy again so andrew you know he's been kind of motoring along like even though he's an old guy and a lot of his friends are dying off he's still being fairly active yeah, and he loved to follow the politics of the time and global events and he's a huge and i mean huge advocate for peace i mean that's his life mission right now is to ensure that you know peace is maintained in the world. Yeah, and you know, NASA has like full chapters dedicated to his attempts to really bring about this international arbitration as opposed to conflict. And, you know, we totally skipped over the hand that he had in the Hague conference and and all that stuff. But just know that Andrew Carnegie was about as in favor of peace as a person can be. Yeah, and he really pushed actively for peace. I mean, he could see that tensions were rising in Europe And he could see that, like, Germany is building up their armaments. And he actually even went on a safari. Well, no, he funded Roosevelt's safari. So Carnegie wanted Roosevelt to be his advocate because by this Mm -hmm. point, you know, Roosevelt was no longer president, but he was still widely respected as a world leader. Right. And Carnegie was like, I need you to go speak to Kaiser Wilhelm for me, Mm -hmm. who was the leader of Germany. And Roosevelt was like, man, I want to go on a safari. And, (laughs) And Carnegie was like, listen, I will pay for that safari just go and do my bidding in Germany. And that's basically what happens. And then, you know, Andrew, back at home, is still getting on Taft's nerves. Yeah. Because he's just constantly pushing for peace. Like, if anything happens in the world where it seems like this might lead to war, Andrew's like, guys, let's talk about this. Let's go to The Hague. Like, yeah. what, like what can we do? Arbitration. I, I, like, in my mind, he's just, like, sending a letter a day that just says arbitration to Taft. And <laughs> Taft is just, like, throwing them <laughs> into the fireplace. You know, it becomes apparent pretty quickly in the 1912, 1913 that there's just too much money for Andrew to give away. So he's got to figure out a way to make sure that his mission continues after he dies. So November 10th, 1911, he forms the Carnegie Corporation of New York. That was basically the body that would outlive him in order to give away 
his wealth. The initial endowment was for $25 million, which is the equivalent of $8 billion today. Hmm. And still a lot of the charity that comes out of, or that is in Andrew Carnegie's name and the Carnegie family's name today comes out of that corporation. And in the following year, in 1914, he spends that entire year pretty much working on his autobiography, but he's growing increasingly worried about the gathering clouds of war that's kind of washing over Europe and the rest of the world. Yeah, and you know, we're not going to talk too much about World War I. There's several... Many a book. Right, that you can go out and read to, to find out more about that and all the things that went into it. But being such an agent for peace, World War I really aged Andrew. You know, Nassau really paints this portrait of Andrew as truly like withering away during the war because like all the work that he had put into trying to prevent something like this and it was just mass loss of life. Everything he had tried to do was basically for nothing. I want to say that it was probably tough on him because throughout most of his life, he'd been really successful in almost anything that he had tried. And I think the cause for peace was actually something that was very important to him and his inability to actually make that happen. I mean, in fact, he had to have looked at World War I as an absolute and utter failure yeah. because he, he'd strived to prevent war and here we have the war to end all wars, you know, the most violent conflict in human history up until that point. So it was definitely tough on him. I'm not sure how I feel about like Nassau's portrayal of like the day the war started, Andrew aged 40 years. Yeah. And he was suddenly the crypt keeper. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm sure it did send him into yeah. a depression, though. By Nassau's portrayal, his health really starts to decline during the years of the war. By spring 1917, Andrew was in constant care of nurses. His health was really on the downslope. You know, Nassau also really points to Margaret's wedding as like a motivation for Andrew to hang on to his life. Like he really wanted to see his daughter married. And so she was married on April 23rd, 1919. And uh, shortly after that, Andrew died in August of 1919. That takes us to the end of the life of Andrew Carnegie. If nothing else, this man lived a full life. Like, I don't know if, I don't know how much more you could pack into one human lifetime than what Andrew Carnegie did. Yeah, no, I, I'd, I'd have to agree with that. And I think, you know, overall, we can take a step back now and give our personal assessments of uh, Andrew Carnegie. And I think, you know, obviously there's a lot about this man that is a walking, like living contradiction. Oh, yeah. But I think that at a certain level, we can applaud the generosity and the amount of work that he did for legitimate good causes throughout the duration of his life. And I think, you know, a lot of people maybe focus on his pursuit of wealth. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you really look at him for all that he was, I mean, I think he was, he was a lot more than just a guy who was pursuing wealth. I mean, I think that the underlying driving force behind that was not necessarily the money, but the sort of philanthropic endeavors, the ideas that he had. Yeah, and the way I look at it is, to me, Andrew was a good person. Is basically, you know, I'm comfortable saying that I think Andrew Carnegie was a good person. He clearly had to do some mental gymnastics in order to justify the way that he treated workers. Like, I cannot bring myself to believe that Andrew Carnegie, who looked at the poor in the world and was like clearly very and truly dedicated to helping them, you know, he put his money where his mouth was, that he could look at the workers who were the working poor. You know what I mean? It wasn't yeah. like a middle class here. Like they were the working poor and to just continue to abuse them. It's like, there's no way that he actually didn't recognize what he was doing. And so I guess it was one of those, like the ends justify the means situations. Hey, you know what form? they say, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. He yeah. certainly had good intentions, but my God, he built a massive empire on the backs of these workers. And it's just, it's, it's kind of interesting to try to think about how he reconciled his actions with those sort of loftier goals. Yeah. But I mean, like anyone else, any other human, he's a complicated figure. You know, it's, it's hard to just say good person, bad person. I think that's the theme of our show. Basically. Has been just like, people are people. People are complicated day. AF. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, really though, I can't imagine fitting more life into 83 years than Andrew Carnegie did. This man lived multiple people's lives. All the learning, the traveling. I mean, literally the only place that I don't think we ever talked about him going was like South America. And he may have. I'm sure he did. <laughs> Who knows? I mean, like world traveler, writer, capitalist, philanthropist. Pre-Tony Stark days, too. Dude, basically. Man. Probably had like a wooden Iron Man suit. 
Yeah. I mean, I would it would be steel. Yeah. Steel, steel man. man. <laughs> Doesn't have the same ring to it. No, it really doesn't. All right. Well, friends, this episode has gone long. That's because we didn't want to have like a 20 minute part five. Mm-hmm. So thank you all for listening. As we mentioned before, we're going to be going down to a potentially not every week schedule. We will get these episodes out to you as soon as we can. But keep subscribed. If you're not subscribed, what are you doing? Subscribe to us. Right now, if you enjoy what we're doing here at The Life Effects and would like to help us, we would super appreciate if you could just leave us a five-star rating and review in iTunes. Tell a friend. If you want to look for other ways to support the show, you can head over to lifeofxpodcast.com and click through to our support page. Other than that, we will return as soon as we possibly can. Thank you so much for listening. Hey, Eric. Hey. Cue the music.